to the beginning of chapter 2. So nice and loud, everybody in English, okay? Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become a servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Father, we thank you for the words of Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written down and kept and preserved all these years for us today. And uh, Lord, it is a very rich and very precious and very deep uh, part of your, of your Bible, and I pray that you will help me to uh, un, uh, unpack it a little bit and a little bit to our life, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will really speak to each and every one of us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's much better if you've got a Bible, you can follow along um, and read along with me. And if you do look at the book, um, you will see how Paul starts. He, it's, it's really a letter. He starts with a greeting, and then he starts with a prayer, uh, thanksgiving, and then he has a prayer, and then he, and he starts talking about the supremacy of Christ, which is what we talked about last Sunday, that, that Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is Lord. And, and he's saying that, you know, these people that are trying to deceive you, they're trying to draw you away, you know, you need to understand all the wisdom and all the knowledge that comes uh, from, from God. And so he, he basically, he's sending a message to the Christians there that when the empire... Uh, starts to, to stress you and put pressure on you. You need to be brave, you need to have courage, and you need to stand up and say, no, no, I don't want to listen to your lies. Jesus is Lord. And when they try to draw you away, uh, you say, no, no, no. Uh, Christ is, is the creator. You know, he's not the created being. He, he is the creator. So Paul um, is now going to start talking about how he himself fits into God's plan. And in this letter, he describes himself in three ways. He says that, uh, he says, I am a servant of Christ, I am a servant of the gospel, and I am a servant of the church. But actually, um, it's not, not just Paul who's like this, right? I think every Christian, this is a description of every Christian, that every Christian is a, a servant of Christ, a servant of the gospel, and a servant of the church. Agree? Agree? Yes. Agree? Yes. In our church, we talk about the church staff and the church volunteers. But actually, that is not a very biblical way of looking at things. It's, it's a bit of a worldly way, actually. The Bible doesn't talk about church staff or church volunteers. The Bible just says that we're all servants. 
of Christ. We're all servants of the gospel and we're all servants of the church. I think it's very hard to say, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to be this. You know, it's, it's a package deal, okay? Uh, you can't say, oh, I want to be a Christian, you know, but I don't want to be a servant. But the reality is, is this is what we are, I think. And um, if we are like this, then what do we actually have to do? Um, what do we do as servants? And there may be many, many answers to that question, but here in this passage, Paul gives three answers about what uh, he was doing, he was actually doing. So he starts off in the first uh, couple of verses uh, by saying that, what he's trying to do is to present the Word of God in all its fullness. And then he talks about uh, how, he, how he's trying to proclaim Christ to everyone. And then he talks about uh, protecting uh, God's people from deception. So we'll look at the first point uh, where he says, present the Word of God in its fullness. And the first thing he says about this is that he is willing to suffer for the Gospel. So he starts off in verse 24. And he says this, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. So this is a very um, uh, somewhat difficult verse. What, what does that mean? Is, is Paul saying, you know, Christ suffered, but it wasn't quite enough suffering, so I'm suffering so that all my sins will be forgiven. Is that, that's not what he's saying, is it? No. He's not saying, oh, you know, one day when I die, I'll go down to purgatory, and there I can suffer some more, and if I suffer enough, I can fill up the sufferings of Christ, and then I can go to heaven. No, that's not what he's saying. And the Bible is very clear that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all our sins. For all of our sins. We don't have to suffer so that our sins will be forgiven. We don't have to do that. When Christ was on the cross, how many words did he speak from the cross? Seven, Seven right? Seven words from the cross. And one of the words that he spoke, one of the sentences was just one word. It was a Greek word, tetelestai. And in the English Bible, it is translated most usually as it is finished. But actually, the Greek word actually means paid in full. That's actually what it means. So when, when Christ was there on the cross, one of the things that he cried out was, it is paid in full. Now what is paid in full? The debt, the punishment what we owed because of our sin. All, all the punishment has been paid in full. And so we are free. And that's a very clear teaching of the Bible, is that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all our sins. And we don't have to go to purgatory, and we don't have to go through suffering in this life so that our sins will be forgiven. So he's not saying that. But what he is saying here is that when Christ suffered and died on the cross. He did it to, to, to purchase, in a sense, the free gift of eternal life. This free gift. And, and, and there it is. But Paul took this gift, and he took it here, and he took it there, and he took it all around the place, and he told everybody about it, and he said, do you want it? Do you want it? And in his journeys and in his preaching, he suffered. Paul suffered. If you know anything of the story of Paul, I mean, he was beaten and he was flogged and he was stoned and he was thrown in prison and he suffered in his missionary work, in his gospel work as a servant of, of the gospel. And so there is a sense in which Paul did what Christ could not do. Christ did not go to the Gentiles. He, Christ went to the Jews first. Paul was the one who took the gospel to the Gentiles. And in that sense, Paul was suffering with Christ. And it's the same with you and me, actually. Uh, because if you begin to serve God, you may suffer as well. Um, 
But Paul was willing. Paul was willing to suffer. So that's the first thing he says. He's willing to suffer. And then he says that uh, he's trying to explain God's plan. This is what he's trying to do. He's out there. He may be suffering, but it's okay because he's trying to explain God's plan. And he talks about this in verse 25, the next verse. I have become its servant, or the gospel servant, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Verse 26, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. So he's talking here about a mystery that was hidden for ages and generations. But now, in Paul's time, and now today, is disclosed. It's, it's, we, we know it. We know this mystery. So the plan that God had, he, he always had it. The plan how to save people. God hid it in the Old Testament. Now today, we look back at the Old Testament, and we can see it. If you read the Old Testament, you see this unfolding of this plan. But the people in the Old Testament times, they didn't really get it. They didn't really understand what the plan was. It was hidden for ages and generations in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's been revealed and we can see it in the Old Testament. And you would wonder, you know, why did God hide it from them? Why did God not make it more clear? Why did He, why did he only leave hints and clues? Well, I think God hides many things, actually. In the physical world, He hides gold and silver in the ground. I mean, why doesn't He just put it on the top? You know, we, we, can, we can get it easy, you know? you know. He puts it in the ground. And if you really want it, if you really look for it, you will find it. He puts diamonds and rubies and precious stones in the mountains. And if you really want them, you really, really want to find them. You can. And it's a similar thing in the spiritual realm. There are things that God, He hides them, not too far, but they're hidden. But if you really want to know, you can know. If you really want to find them, you can find them. And He hides them there because He wants us to look and He wants us to see and He wants us to find them. And this is what God did in the Old Testament. He put a plan in the Old Testament. And uh, it's now being revealed. And Paul is, is describing this, this plan. And then, as part of it, he points people to the mystery, which is the next verse. To them, to the, Gentile, to the Gentiles, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is that are Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the Gnostics and the false teachers in those days, they loved mysteries. They just loved secrets. They loved their books. They had all kinds of secret knowledge in their books. And they said, if you want to really know the secrets, come and we'll show you from our books. But Paul says, no, no, no. The real mystery, the real secret is not in your books. The real secret is in Christ. The real mystery is in Christ. And it's really interesting, um, the last few weeks I've been preaching about this, talk about Gnosticism. And as soon as I start talking about Gnosticism, I can see some people's eyes, they become very, very kind of sleepy, you know. They, they kind of, what, what is he talking about, you know, or nothing to do with me, you know. But it actually is. So I'm going to try and make it relevant for us today by talking a little bit about the most famous Gnostic in the world today. The most famous Gnostic person in the world today. So turn to your neighbour and tell, tell your neighbour who you think that person might be. If you already know them, don't tell them, alright? Who do you think the most famous Gnostic in the world would be today? Anyone got any idea? Uh, probably one with Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson. <laughs> alright, well move on. Uh, let me give you some clues, alright? Give you some clues. He's a man. He's rich. And he's a movie star. Oh, easy. 
Oh, yeah, there. No, this is what I think anyway. This is what I think. He's a very, very famous Gnostic because his cult, this cult of Scientology, is like a hundred percent Gnostic. Okay? So they have all kinds of secrets. They have many, many secrets. And if you want to get to the top of the pile, it will take you many, many years of hard work and a lot of money. Probably, probably all your money to get to the top. There are many, many secrets. Not, uh, science, Scientology is a lot like an onion, okay? Like an onion. So what, what, what you do is you pay your money, you do what they say, and then when you've accomplished this certain level, they will tell you a secret. They will tell you a secret. And then you kind of peel off one layer of the other level. And then you find, oh, there's another layer. And so what do you do? You pay your money and you go through the processes and do what they tell you to do. And when you've accomplished it well, they will, they will tell you a secret. And you peel off another layer. And that's the way life is, and you peel off another layer, and another layer, and another layer, and another layer. And if you go through the whole process, you will find that there are no more layers left, there's only nothing. You get to the middle of the onion and there's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's like, it's like, being, on a, it's like being on a treadmill. You run, and 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 you, run and you never get anywhere. You never get anywhere. Tom, Tom Cruise will tell you that there are gods above gods, above gods, above gods. The gods are beyond gods and beyond gods. And if you knew the secrets, you would understand that actually you are a god. You are God. But Paul here in the Bible says, no, 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 you're not a god. You're a human being. You're not a God, you're a human. But the God of creation, the God of the universe, by His Holy Spirit, can come and dwell in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's a really wonderful thing, to we have hope. We have hope in this world. I don't know, I don't know how you feel, um, but I think, I think there's a lot of hopelessness in the world today. Um, I think he was telling me um, that there's a saying in Chinese now, a modern, a modern saying. It's called lying flat. <laughs> lying flat. And all the young people, no, many young people uh, in China uh, uh, think this is, this is what we should do. We should just. Because if you go and study or you go and work or you try to get married, or you try to have children, or you try to buy a house, it's, it's hopeless. It's just hopeless. There's no future. And so it's much, much better just to do nothing. And just go through day by day and just almost give up. Almost giving up. And it's very sad. It's very, very sad. But we, you know, we have Christ. And we have hope. We have Christ, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And it is a wonderful thing. We have a hope for tomorrow and a hope for eternity. And it's really wonderful. So that was the first thing um, Paul talks about here. He talks about presenting the Word of God in all of its fullness. And then he talks about proclaiming Christ to everyone. So this is in verse 28. And the first thing about it is that we proclaim Christ, not ourselves. So it talks about it in verse 28. We proclaim Him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect or, or mature in Christ. So he says, we proclaim Him. We don't, we don't talk about, we don't talk about uh, our church. You know, we, don't, we don't go around telling them, oh, God's great church. Can change your life, you know. I, I remember we were in San Francisco. We went to this very liberal church. There was no cross on the wall. The whole service they never talked about. They never mentioned the name of Jesus. There was no Bibles anywhere. It was a very, very liberal church. 
And everyone who got on the stage, every single person who got on the stage, they said the same thing. The church was called Glide. That's right, Glide Memorial Church. Very famous in San Francisco. And everyone who got on the stage, they all said the same thing. They said, Glide has changed my life. Glide has changed my life. I used to be lost and I was out there in the room and I came here and I found a family and Glide has changed my life. Which is a very nice thing, but it's not the church that changes people's lives, is it? It's God who changes people's lives. It's Christ who changes people's lives. We don't talk about, oh, our church, our church, blah, 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 blah. And we don't talk about our pastor, our pastor, oh, you must come and meet our pastor. Oh, well, he's... <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's fantastic. He's what? He's fantastic. Oh, he's he's just bald and he's, <laughs> he's old and he's got wrinkles. We don't talk about the pastor. We don't talk about the church. We don't talk about ourselves. We proclaim Christ. Okay, we proclaim Christ, admonishing everybody. Admonishing means to warn. And people need to know that after we die. The Bible is very clear. It says, man is appointed to die once, and then comes judgment. And people need to know that. People have forgotten that. It is appointed unto man and woman to die once, and then comes judgment. It's in Hebrews, somewhere in Hebrews, I've forgotten. We do it gently, we do it humbly, we do it sensitively. But we admonish people. That's what we should, we should remind people about. And we need to correct people too. Because there are such things as sin. I mean, sin is real. The government maybe legalizes it. Um, the culture maybe um, celebrates it. Uh, people think that it's good. But the Bible calls it sin. And in a gentle and humble and sensitive way, we need to show them that the Bible says this is sin. We admonish people. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Everyone. That's the, that's the next thing he says. To everyone. That the Gnostics, the false teachers, they said, oh, not everyone can be saved. Not everyone can be saved. Only one in a thousand. Or two in ten thousand. That's what they said. Paul says, no, 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 no. The Bible says, no, no, no. Everyone. God loves everyone. Right? He loves everyone. He wants all people to be saved. And so that is why Paul said, I, we proclaim Christ. We proclaim Him to everyone. Everyone. And then he says, laboring. Verse 29. To this end, I labor, struggling with all His energy, which so powerfully works in me. I labor, I struggle, and I work hard. I don't sit back. I don't say, oh, you know, Lord, uh, I know you love them. Uh, when it's their time, I'm sure you'll save them, so, you know, go for it. We don't say that. We partner with God. We work with Him. And we... Work hard with his power. And you will find that when you step out in faith, you may think, I can't do this, I don't know how to do this, I'm sure I can't do this, but God, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. And you, you will find that when you step out like that, God's power comes into your life. If you stay at home and sit on the couch, you will never experience God's power. You will never experience it. As you step out, as you, as you try to do something for the Lord, that's when His power comes into our life. And that's, that's when we can say this. You know, I, can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that's the second thing that he says. As a servant of Christ, as a servant of the church, as a servant of the gospel, he wants to present the word with all of its fullness. He wants to proclaim Christ to everyone. And then he wants to try to protect God's people from deception. How does he do that? 
Well, the first thing he does in chapter 2, he, he wants to promote unity. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those that play at here and for all who have not yet met me personally. My purpose, my goal, is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Encouraged in heart and united in love. The Bible says very clearly that there are, it is an enemy of Christians. Um, they are real. They are, they are evil spirits. And the Bible says that they prowl around like roaring lions, looking for someone to devour. So who are they looking for? What kind of people are they looking for? If you think of a lion, you know, a lion sneaking through the grass, and there's a bunch of zebras over the air, sort of eating their lunch, and the lion's coming out. Well, who's he looking for? The weak ones. And uh, the ones that aren't paying attention, the ones that have wandered away, the naughty boys, the naughty girls that have wandered away, those are the ones he's looking, they're looking for. And so that's why Paul says we need to be united in love. And if you're, if you're part of a, an active and healthy church, it's much more difficult for Satan to, to grab you. If you're part of a small group where you can fellowship with Christians, it's much more difficult for Satan to, to eat you. So that's why he's encouraging them to be united in love. It's very important. And then he says, he says it's very important that we know that Christ is our treasure. This is in verse 2. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God and in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the, the false teachers, they had all their books. They said, oh, this is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Paul saying, no, 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 no. All the wisdom, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. So you have to imagine that Christ is a bit like a, a treasure box or a treasure house. And he's full of treasures, and they are there to be discovered, and they are there to be enjoyed. All the treasures are in Christ. And um, I heard a story, I'm not sure it's a true story, but it's a good story. And you may have heard the story before, but like all good stories, the more you tell them, the better they are, the better they become, right? So this story is about a farmer, and it's about a buried treasure. And there was this old farmer, he was lying on his deathbed, and he was almost ready to go. And so he calls in his two sons, and he says, Sons, sons, come, come. I have a secret to tell you. On our farm, there is buried treasure. Wow. The two sons were very excited. Wow, Dad, so good. Buried treasure on our farm. Yes, but I forgot where I buried it. <laughs> I forgot where I buried it. But I know, I know, it's only about this deep down. It's only about 300 mils down. And then he dies. So after the winter, the spring comes, the two boys, they get out their tractor and they start plowing up the, the whole farm. Every square centimetre of that farm, they plowed it up, but they couldn't find the treasure. So they looked at each other and said, well, you know, we plowed the ground and as we plant it. Plant their seeds. And the seeds came up, and in the summer they harvested their seeds and they made a nice profit. Well, the next year came around and spring came and they got out their tractor and they plowed up that whole farm again. But they couldn't find the treasure. And they looked at each other and they thought, well, you know, plowed the ground and might as well plant it. So they planted their seeds and that summer they harvested their seeds and they made a really good profit. Year after year after year. And the two sons became very wealthy. And they began to realize the wisdom of their father. There was treasure in the ground, but not the treasure that they thought that they were going to get. There is treasure in Christ, but not always the kind of treasure that we 
and think, what kind of treasure is in Christ? Treasure is to know God and to know ourself. And to know our true identity and our true purpose and our true destiny and where our true security lies and to know uh, the hope that we have. And because of that hope, we will have joy in our life. And we will have a saviour, a wonderful saviour, who can walk with us. There is treasure in Christ. So, to conclude, here we are. Servants of Christ, servants of the gospel, and servants of the church. What do we do? Well, there are many things we can do, of course, but here are three. Here are three. And uh, I know that maybe some of you are working hard uh, in this, um, particularly those who teach the children and those who serve here in um, Mosaic and those who serve. But I, I want to encourage you, you know, never be discouraged. Uh, it, it is a struggle to serve God, but never be discouraged. Um, never be distracted and never give up. Never give up. Because if you give up, you might never see the fruit. If you give up, you, you might never see the fruit. And that's been my experience. And when our church first started, uh, the first few years of the church, it grew quite a lot. But it was mainly people who were Christians who had immigrated to Christchurch and came and joined our church. We saw a few people become Christian, but not, not that many. And then in 1995, um, Something terrible happened in the church. It was really the worst year of my life. Fortunately, I don't have time to tell you all the details. Um, but it was really a tough year for Becky and me. And we, we felt that all we could do was pray and keep our mouths shut. And say, God, you, you, you're our Lord. You, you do the fighting for us. I wanted to give up. I wanted to leave. Um, but we didn't. And all we, all we did was we tried to respond in the opposite spirit. We tried to be gracious. We tried to forgive and we tried to have a big heart. So we managed to get through that year. That was 1995. 1996, it was like spiritual revival broke out in our church. That year we had 40 people baptised into Christ that next year. We had never seen people come to Christ like this. The following year, we had 60 people come to Christ. And for years and years and years, in the next 20 plus years, it was the same. It was amazing. It was beyond what I had ever imagined would ever happen. That that many people could come to Christ. And I was, you know, if we'd given up, maybe the church would have gone on and things would have happened the same, but we would not have experienced had that experience. We would not have seen the fruit. So don't give up, you know, if you give up, then you may never see the fruit of what, of what God can do uh, in and through you. So I want to, um, oh, there it is, I want to share this verse with you, maybe we can read together, right? And then can we sing uh, In Christ Alone, would that be alright? So you come, let us all stand, and we'll sing, uh, and we'll say this verse together, right? One, two, three. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor.